Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today we're looking at the top 10 Mafia leaders who were not murdered and died totally normal deaths. We've all heard about the Mafia, and a lot of us have something of a fascination with the lives of Mafia members. And when we think about them, we mostly imagine they either died in prison, or they were made to sleep with the fishes, or were whacked. This video, however, presents those important but lucky ones from the Prohibition era that did not meet the fate reserved for people like them, and who instead were met with a normal end, not dying in some prison cell on the electric chair or being gunned down, but rather from natural causes. Sometimes they were even at home and surrounded by their family. Number 10. Maya Lansky, the mob accountant. Born on July 4, 1902, in Grodno, Russia, now Poland, he immigrated to the United States in 1911 under the name of Maya Sokoyansky and settled in New York City. In 1920, he met Bugsy Siegel and Lucky Luciano. Together with Bugsy, they formed the Bug and Mayer Mob. Later, Blansky came to be known as one of the Big Six, along with Bugsy Siegel, Jacob Gura Shapiro, Louis Lepke Bacalta, Lucky Luciano, and Joe Adonis. His initial big money came from the gambling operations that he established in Florida, Cuba, and New Orleans. He was also the man who suggested Bugsy Siegel to handle the construction and management of the Flamingo Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas as an investor. By the 1960s, Lansky was involved in numerous criminal activities, such as drugs, pornography, extortion, etc. It was estimated that his total holdings were around $300 million. In the FBI files, an informant states that on April 26, 1963, Lansky was extremely wealthy and has more points in the Las Vegas casinos than anyone else. Those files also state that Lansky was associated with practically every known leading figure in organized crime and was equal in rank to all of the leading 10 La Cosa Nostra figures in the the United States. In 1970, he was risking arrest for income tax evasion, which made him flee to Israel. He, however, could not escape arrest and was returned to the United States. The charges were later dropped because of his poor health. Mayer died of lung cancer in Miami Beach, Florida on May 15, 1983, at age 80. Even though he was estimated to be worth $300 million, no money was ever found. His granddaughter told author T.J. English that at his death, Lansky only left $37,000 in cash. Number 9. Johnny Papatorio, aka The Immune. Born on January 20, 1882 in Italy, Torrio's mother immigrated with him to the U.S. after the death of his father when he was two years old. They settled in New York and his mother later remarried. His stepfather owned a grocery store, which was an illegal liquor front where he was hired as a porter. This place was the start of Torrio's criminal career. As a teenager, he joined the James Street Gang. The gang was connected to the Five Points Gang, which was run by Paolo Vaccarelli. Torrio saved enough money and opened a billiards hall in Brooklyn. The place soon became a hangout for rising criminals such as Al Capone. Torino's success drew the attention of Paolo Vaccarelli, who made him his lieutenant. Paolo Vaccarelli also made Torrio his mentee, transforming Torrio from a street thug into a well-dressed businessman. After a while, he moved from New York to Chicago, when his uncle by marriage, Big Jim Colosimo, made him second in command. Colosimo controlled much of the Chicago underworld. His organization was known as the Chicago Outfit. In 1919, when the Prohibition era began, Colosimo didn't want to be part of the illegal distribution of liquor. Two years later, on May 11, 1921, Colosimo was killed while leaving a meeting. No one was charged, but one of the suspects was Capone. After Colosimo's death, Johnny Torrio became the leader of the outfit, and with the help of Capone, the bootlegging operation brought in as much as $100 million per year at the height of the Prohibition. An assassination attempt on January 24, 1925, sent Torrio into semi-retirement. He moved to Italy and left the outfit to Capone. Later in his life, he returned to the United States to serve as a mentor to Lucky Luciano and the Genovese family in New York. He is credited for the creation of the National Crime Syndicate, which later became the Commission. In 1939, he was sentenced to two years in prison. After his release, he retired. He died in April of 1957 from a heart attack at the age of 75 while sitting in his barber's chair. Number 8. Paul the Waiter Rica Born in 1897 in Naples, Italy, as Felipe de Lucia, he changed his name to Paul Maglio and fled to the United States via Cuba because of a murder he had committed. On his way to America, he met a bootlegger and restaurant owner from Chicago called Joseph Diamond Joe Esposito. Once he arrived in the U.S., he changed his name to Paul Rica and moved from New York to Chicago and started smuggling whiskey and moonshine liquor. Diamond Joe soon appointed him head of waiters at his restaurant, thus gaining the nickname The Waiter. In his time as head of the waiters, he met Al Capone, who was a frequent patron of the restaurant. 
After meeting Capone, he went to work for him. He rose very quickly in the gang's ranks and soon became good friends with Capone. When Capone was convicted in 1932 for tax evasion and sent to federal prison, Frank, the enforcer Nitty, became the boss and Paul Rica, the underboss. However, Carl Sifakis, crime historian, claims that Rica was the real boss in the organization. Sifakis also said that Paul Rica was one of the most stereotypical gangsters ever produced by the Chicago mob. When he wanted someone killed, apparently he would just say, make him go away. After 1950, Rica started passing responsibilities to Tony Accardo, who was a good friend, but in 1957, he chose to replace him with Sam Giancana, as Accardo was facing tax evasion charges, and Rica may have wanted for Accardo to take a low profile. However, as Rica aged, Accardo began to make the high-level decisions. In 1959, Rica was convicted of tax evasion and was sentenced to nine years in prison, but was mysteriously released after serving only 27 months. Rica faced another indictment in 1965, again for tax evasion, but he was eventually acquitted. He retired to Detroit, where he died of a heart attack at 75 on October 11, 1972. He was considered the brains behind Al Capone, Frank Nitti, and Tony Accardo's operations. Number 7. Enoch Naki L. Johnson as the son of the elected sheriff of Atlantic County, he also joined the force, first as the undersheriff and later in 1908, when his father's term expired, the sheriff. After 1911, when he no longer held the position, he went on holding various other jobs, such as Atlantic County treasurer, county tax collector, newspaper publisher, bank director, brewery director, and after 1945, a salesman for an oil company. He was a lover of fine things, and his trademark was a fresh red carnation on his lapel, and in the winter, he was often seen wearing a raccoon coat. He he also had a German personal assistant and a valet. His headquarters were a ninth floor suite at the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Enoch's power reached its peak during the Prohibition era, as it was not effectively enforced in Atlantic City, which allowed for a very lucrative bootlegging business. Johnson's income came from percentages he took from the selling of illegal liquor and other activities, such as gambling and prostitution. Under Johnson's rule, Atlantic City was known as one of the biggest ports for importing illegal alcohol. He was also the host for the Atlantic City Conference in 1929, which was a national gathering of of crime leaders like Al Capone. The meeting was instrumental in creating the true organization with which the syndicate thrived in the first half of the 20th century. His reign would come in 1941, as he was indicted for income tax evasion. He was convicted of evading $125,000 in taxes. His sentence was 10 years in prison. He only served four years of his sentence, as he was released on parole in 1945. He returned to Atlantic City, but chose not to continue his previous business. Instead, he worked in sales for the Richfield Oil Company. He died on December 9, 1960 at the Atlantic City Convalescent Home in Northfield, New Jersey. He was 85 years old. I can't find anybody in the first half of the 20th century who was as dominant a boss in his community, and was a power in two different worlds, organized crime and politics, and was able to make those two spheres one thing. This is a quote by author Nelson Johnson. Number 6. Tony Big Tuna Ricardo, aka Joe Batters. Born from Sicilian immigrants on April 26, 1906 in Chicago, he had no legal troubles until 1922 when he was arrested for a motor vehicle violation. He later joined the Circus Cafe Gang, a name gotten for their hangout at the Circus Cafe, which was owned by gangster John Moore, also known as Claude Maddox. Tony, as a member of this gang, became close friends with his fellow gang member Vincenzo de Mora. De Mora was promoted to Al Capone's personal gang, and as Capone needed more soldiers for his operations, de Mora vouched for Tony Accardo. He was made a made man in Capone's gang in the spring of 1926, and he swore the oath of a murder, the code of silence. Accardo was promoted to personal driver and bodyguard after saving Capone's life by pulling him down and shielding him as Capone's rivals fired at them. In 1931, when Capone was jailed for income tax evasion, he became captain. In the 1940s, Tony Accardo became the second man in the organization, since many of the top mobsters were jailed for their implication in the Hollywood extortion case, having only Paul Rica, who was also his friend and counsel above him. Tony Accardo always denied any role in the Chicago mob. When Paul Rica retired in 1968, Tony allegedly became mob chief, and when Paul Rica died in 1972, he became the ultimate authority. Accardo died at 86 years old on May 27, 1992, of heart and lung disease. His criminal career spanned over several decades, but he never spent a night in jail. Number 5. Giuseppe Antonio Dotto, known as Joe Adonis, aka Joey A., Joe DeMeo, James Arosa, and Joe Adonis. Born on November 22, 1902, in Campania, Italy, he arrived in 1915 to New York City. Here, he made a living by pickpocketing and stealing whatever he could. At a young age, he met Charles Lucky Luciano, and the two became very good friends. In the 1920s, as Luciano went on working for Joe Masseria, Joe Adonis stayed and chose to work for Mafia boss Frankie Yale, who controlled much of the criminal activities in Brooklyn. After Luciano arranged the murder of Masseria in 1931 with the contribution of Joe Adonis, Luciano took control of Masseria's family and formed the 
National Crime Syndicate, the Commission. Joe Adonis was appointed on the board of directors for this organization, and thus he received a great deal of power. Adonis established his headquarters at his restaurant, Joe's Italian Kitchen. From here, he managed to net millions of dollars in profit from all kinds of operations such as prostitution, gambling, etc., and by 1932 he was controlling the whole of Brooklyn. In 1944, Adonis moved his headquarters from Brooklyn to New Jersey to another restaurant called Duke's Restaurant, located in Cliffside Park. Adonis managed to avoid prison until 1951 when he was forced to plead guilty to violation of state gambling laws. In 1956, as he was facing charges for perjury, Adonis agreed to be deported to Italy. Adonis lived a life of luxury in his Milan villa, occasionally meeting with his lifelong friend Charles Luciano. He attended a requiem mass for Charles Luciano's death, where, with tears in his eyes, he presented a final floral tribute to his friend with the message, So long, pal. In June of 1971, he was exiled by a Milan court to the town of Ancona. Six months later, on November 26th, he died of natural causes at the age of 69. His remains were returned to the USA. Number 4. Raymond Laredo Salvatore Patriarca Sr. The boss of the Patriarca family in New England for nearly 30 years was born in Massachusetts in 1908 to Italian immigrants. His criminal career started from an early age, and by the 1930s he was given the status of public enemy number one, but by using his political connections he was able to get a pardon. During the 1940s, Patriarca was on a power rise, and after Philip Bricola, the boss of the family, fled the country to avoid prosecution, Patriarca took his place as the boss. During his career he was arrested more than 30 times for charges ranging from bootlegging to conspiracy and even murder. He served several prison sentences. The last charges he faced were in 1983 for ordering the murder of burglar Ray Curcio, the man who broke into the home of his brother. One year later, he was arrested for another killing, that of Robert Candos, another robber. He was not convicted for this one, though, as he died of a heart attack before the start of the trials. He was 76 years old. The power was inherited by his son, Raymond Patriarca Jr. Number 3. Joseph Joe Bananas Banano Banano was born on January 18, 1905 in Italy to a powerful Sicilian family, so he got front row seats in observing the men of honor, the men of the old tradition, the name referring to the Sicilian Mafia members. Banano moved to the United States when he was three, but only for a short while because four years later his family had to move back to Italy due to rising tensions between his family and the rival Bucciatello family. Banano lost both his parents by the time he was a teenager. He then went on to become a sailor, but the rise of the power of Benito Mussolini got him suspended for his activities as an anti-fascist. As a result, he had to leave the country, and he went back to the United States. Not before long, Bonanno got involved in bootlegging, and he went to work for Salvatore Marzano as an enforcer. Bonanno was a great help to Maranzano in the Castella Marese War, but the war ended with the murder of Maranzano. Bonanno took over his crime family, which later became to be known as the Bonanno family. Over the years, Bonanno strove for respectability by investing in a number of legitimate businesses that helped him with his illegal activities. After serving eight months in 1983 for obstruction of justice, his biography, A Man of Honor, was released, which angered the other New York Mafia leaders, as it was considered that he broke the Amerta, the Code of Silence. His autobiography drew the attention of then U.S. District Attorney Rudy Giolani, who wanted Bonanno to testify about his criminal connections. As Bonanno refused to comply, he received a 14-month term in a federal medical facility. After his release in 1986, he moved to his home in Tucson. He is one of the few Mafia members who got to retire from the Mafia. He died of a heart attack on May 11, 2002, at the age of 97 in Tucson. His funeral was attended by 300 people. Banano is credited with creating the double coffin, a coffin with a special compartment for disposing of a corpse beneath another body. Number 2. Alphonse Gabriel Al Capone, aka Scarface. Born on January 17, 1899 in Brooklyn, New York, Capone was not like the usual gangster from the early 20th century who came from impoverished backgrounds. He was from a respectable, professional immigrant family, and we believe that the career that followed couldn't easily have been foreseen. Capone's career is tied to meeting John Papagioni Torrio, who became a mentor to Capone, teaching him the tools of the trade in organized crime, especially in the racketeering business. Capone joined Torrio's James Street Boys and later the Five Points Gang, becoming a bouncer at premises such as brothels. In his early 20s, he moved to Chicago, being called for by Torrio, who moved there in 1909 to help him run the Chicago brothel business. It's not exactly known, but it might have been Capone who assassinated Torrio's boss, Big Jim Calissimo, in 1920, helping Johnny Torrio become the new boss. The rise of Capone started as the Prohibition era began, and so new bootlegging operations were opened, which drew immense wealth. By 1927, Capone's wealth was estimated at around $100 million. In 1925, in retaliation to an assassination attempt, Johnny Torrio was attacked and was greatly injured by the North Siders gang. Recovering slowly from this attempt, he handed power over to Capone and moved to Europe. 
After the newfound power, Capone moved his headquarters to the luxurious Metropole Hotel as he wanted to become more visible and something of a celebrity. Capone, dressing in custom-made suits, having gourmet food and drinks, making donations to various charities, started to give him an image that appealed to people. But his image was to suffer greatly, with influential citizens demanding action from the central government. After the multiple assassinations of six Northsiders and a mechanic in 1929, assassinations that were named the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Al Capone's activities attracted the attention of President Herbert Hoover, who told his Secretary of the Treasury, Andrew Mellon, in March 1929 that he wanted Capone in jail. In June 1931, Capone was indicted for federal income tax evasion. He was tried and sentenced to 11 years in prison. His seven-year reign as crime boss ended when he was 33 years old. He entered Atlanta Penitentiary in May of 1932, but was transferred to Alcatraz. From the early period of his sentence, Capone started showing signs of syphilitic dementia. Capone's health deteriorated, and he became confused and disorientated. He he was released after eight years and moved to Baltimore Hospital. He later moved to his estate in Florida, and in 1946, his physician and a Baltimore psychiatrist concluded Capone had the mentality of a 12-year-old child. He died on January 25, 1947, at Palm Island, Florida, at the age of 48. He suffered a stroke and had pneumonia, and had none of his former power and influence. Due to his publicized image, he became the most famous mobster in American history, but not the number one mobster on our list. Number 1. Salvatore Luciana, known as Lucky Luciano Born on November 25, 1897 in Italy, Luciano moved to New York City with his parents in 1906. It took only one year for Luciano to get involved in crime, so at the age of 10 he was mugging, shoplifting, and extorting people. He was also 10 years old the first time he saw life behind bars. He spent six months in jail for selling heroin. The scars on his face were from injuries that he sustained in 1929 from surviving a one-way ride. He was abducted by four men in a car, beaten, stabbed, and had his throat slit. He was left for dead on a beach in Staten Island. The nickname Lucky was earned for his luck at the crabs tables and for avoiding arrest. Teaming up with Frank Costello and Mayor Lansky and other young gangsters, he later joined the crime boss Giuseppe Joe the Boss Messeria in 1920, and by 1925, at age 28, he became the chief lieutenant, responsible for bootlegging, prostitution, narcotics, etc. But Luciano is not known in history for his starting age in the crime business or for surviving the one-way riot. Rather, he's known for the role that he played in the war between Giuseppe Messeria and Salvatore Maranzano. The war was instigated by Maranzano in his attempt, which succeeded for a brief while, to become the boss of bosses. It was this war that led to the establishment of the modern mafia. But the idea of Maranzano being the boss of bosses did not fit well with Luciano. So, six months later, he had Maranzano murdered with the help of Mayor Lansky and four other gunmen. Luciano was now, without direct seeking of the title, the boss of bosses. Luciano did not want the title, so to prevent future wars, he established a power-sharing arrangement called the Commission, a group of five mafia families. His second conviction came in 1936. He was indicted, tried, and convicted for his cool girl empire and extortion. The sentence was for a 30- to 50-year term. Luciano continued to rule from inside the prison, and in 1946, after he helped Navy intelligence in 1942 to end the sabotage on the docks that blew up the luxury airline in Normandy, his sentence was commuted, and he was deported to Italy. He settled in Rome. He died at the airport in Naples in 1962, where he was to meet Martin Gosch about a film based on his life. He was 64 years old. More than 2,000 mourners attended his funeral. In 1998, Time magazine named Lucky Luciano a criminal mastermind and included him in the top 20 most influential builders and titans of the 20th century. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. Do not forget to subscribe to this channel for brand new videos every day of the week. Also, I've got another channel. It's called Biographics. It's biographies of notable people from the present day, as well as history from Elon Musk to Osama bin Laden. You can check it out through the icon on the screen now. But if you want to watch something else right now, why not check out another Top 10s video or a Biographics video over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.